Wow. It has been three years of me hearing about this game. Three years of me having this game be recommended to me across the internet. Three years of hearing all the funny skeleton jokes, all the spaghetti jokes, megalovania, you're gonna have a bad time, and not understanding truly what those phrases meant to people. Three years of hearing about a game that changed people's lives for the better, that changed gaming as a whole, and yet somehow throughout all this time I've not managed to get spoiled on the game, and honestly, thank god. Three years of hearing about this pioneer of indie innovation and not really understanding what people meant. And now, I finally got the opportunity to play it. And now that the time is here, it's time to answer the question, was the wait worth it? Welcome to my video on Undertale. So for those who have been living under a rock for the past three years, Undertale is a hit indie game that changed a lot about how people see the genre as a whole. Sure you've got plenty of duds, but a diamond in the rough is still very possible and this game is living proof of that. Acclaimed with the likes of indie spearheads like Minecraft and Shovel Knight, Undertale has practically created its own definition of an indie game, maybe even a video game in general. This game changed everything. This game exploded back in September of 2015, and I remember it vividly. I remember my friends being hyped up about the game and how imaginative it was, the morality feature. I saw the internet culture begin to grow with this game on YouTube. How many like Jacksepticeye and Markiplier were experiencing wacky subversions for millions to see. And from there, it just took off. Fan art, fan fictions, original characters, you name it. This game is truly a passionate community, if anything. That being said, it's kind of hard to watch some of the fandom doing its thing nowadays, and this is the game where at least i found that fandoms can get kind of crazy intense sometimes. This was the first community I saw truly disturbing things emerge from, and wow. It's time to stop! But all that aside, this could not have spawned from an average game, so let's see what is up. Let's begin with the story. You're a human named Frisk in canon, and you've fallen into the underground, a realm of monsters sealed away by the humans. The monsters and humans are at war, with the humans having the more powerful souls, the humans end up reigning over and sealing the monsters in darkness in the underground. You must venture your way through the underground to reach the surface world again to return home. However, this is where the story becomes catered to how you choose to play the game. You can go on a killing spree, you can go pacifist, or a little bit of both which is where this game gets interesting. This game gives a lot of agency to the player. There are three main paths in the game. True Pacifist, a run where you do not kill a single monster and you do not gain any EXP, which the game later drops on you stands for execution points and LV stands for level of violence. There's the True Genocide route where you kill every monster and boss. And finally, the neutral route is anywhere in between there. There are many various outcomes in the neutral routes, but for the sake of simplicity, we're calling it three main paths. I'm aware there are more than three outcomes, obviously. The game heavily exhausts choice making to alter your route. You're given options to spare or kill enemies, adding a layer into an RPG's gameplay that not many others do. The game also heavily explores the morality of your actions. So in other words, this game's whole spiel is making you question, What if I'm the monster? And what's so weird about this game is that this is an RPG, and yet, I love this game so much. RPGs are not my cup of tea, I gotta admit. There are many fundamental attributes about them that I just do not mix well with at all. And I'm gonna bring this up to emphasize how my love of this game shouldn't even exist. Not necessarily just to bash RPGs. One of my biggest problems with turn-based RPGs is that Every attack feels like the same interaction over and over again. You walk up to a guy, you hit attack, you take damage, you hit attack, and it just keeps going and going and going until the battle ends or you aren't favored in the matchup so you lose. What the fuck? And you have to retread old ground or god forbid grind. Gotta love that grinding. 
And that leads me to probably my biggest pet peeve with RPGs. It feels like there's no weight or agency to your moves. Every attack is just a number going up or down, and there's no avoiding an incoming attack unless it misses due to an arbitrary status effect. At least in turn-based RPGs, it feels so unsatisfying because it feels like all you're doing is navigating a menu. In a game like Zelda, you're slicing bad guys up, you're dodging, rolling, throwing, shooting, it's all happening real time and you feel the physical repercussions and you see visual repercussions as well. In turn-based games, it's like, oh, my guy swung his sword and the guy got this many hit points. Wow. And I don't feel satisfaction in winning these battles because you do them so much. Especially with the random encounter issue that many RPGs have, in my opinion. Of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with this system, and I mean nothing against the people who like RPGs. It's just not my cup of tea. But Undertale somehow remedies all all of these problems that I have with these sorts of games, and it blows my mind. The interactions? Depending on your route, they could all be the same if you're doing true genocide, but many actions in the ACT category of battle are context sensitive, making it feel different, even though it isn't really changing much of anything, but the game does a good job making you feel like it is changing. Sometimes you talk to a monster, sometimes you approach it, sometimes you pet it. It feels like something is changing about the way you interact with the world, and the variety is always increasing. So check. The weight and agency of my moves? Well, for starters, attacks are timing based, and when timed perfectly, the game plays an extra satisfying sound effect, which genuinely feels satisfying. And I know other games do this, so I guess it's not necessarily specific to this game. And you can dodge enemy attacks in an interactive minigame, which allows the game to feel like you can actually control whether you get hit or not. I have also never seen an RPG do this type of dodging, so this is both original and interactive. Check. Does it feel like I'm just navigating a menu? Sort of, but here's the difference. In most games I've experienced, you attack repeatedly until you're low on health, and that's when you change it up and heal. In this game, I'm constantly evaluating whether or not this monster would respond better to this action, or should I just attack for more EXP. I don't feel like I'm just mashing the A button to get to the attack prompt to watch my character throw out a boring attack. Not to mention, the morality factor plays a huge part in how you respond after these battles. And finally, does it feel like you battle too often? No, it doesn't, surprisingly. It feels like you can actually take a look at your surroundings without the paranoia of encountering an enemy every three seconds. Which oftentimes discouraged me from exploring worlds in other RPGs. Take Pokemon. Oh wow, look at this nice tree over here. I wonder what's over. Oh my god. Oh wow, nice, a Pokeball. I can't wait to. Mmm. They, uh, oh. And even when you do encounter enemies, it feels like the variety is continuing to grow and the character of the game shines through every enemy. So, Undertale managed to eliminate the main issues I have with traditional turn based RPGs. And that's not even what this game does best. This game's writing is fantastic. The dialogue, the characters, and the story are all incredibly well crafted. Like, holy crap. There are so many little things that add up to make an incredibly satisfying whole. My favorite example is these snowbanks. All Toby Fox had to do was code one model of a snowbank and have the same dialogue play over all of them. But instead, here's what Toby Fox did do. It's a snow puff. And this is a snow puff. This, however, is a snow puff. Surprisingly, it's a snow puff. Snow puff? Is it really a snow puff? Behold, a snow puff. This is just the tip of the iceberg. It gets so much better when it comes to the humor. Cheesy and cold and cruel sometimes. The dramatic moments and the endings? Oh! They hit like a train! It is incredibly self-aware to the point where it breaks that fourth wall over as if it doesn't even exist. This game is also heavily sprinkled with commentaries about games, society of today, and various nerd culture. From constant interrupting status updates, frequent calls, musical theater, let's playing, anime, etc. The characters are amazing. Somehow, they managed to grow on you so much over a single digit hour game. They are all unique in physical design, and all their dialogue is rich and sticks with you, man. Sans is a funny skeleton who makes bad puns. Papyrus wishes to join the Royal Guard by capturing humans and bringing them to Undyne by giving them puzzles. Undyne wishes to eliminate humans until the monsters are freed. Toriel is a loving, caring surrogate mother figure. 
Alphys is a nerdy, anime-loving lizard thing, and Asgore is a strong but sincerely sweet guy who gives the monsters hope for a bright future. Even then, there are amazing characters who get their moments in a single battle, hell, single lines of dialogue. Knights 1 and 2, the Skeptical Dog, the Dummies, the Monster Kid, Metaton, and the Rivermen are all amazing examples of this. This alone makes the ending of the True Pacifist playthrough so goddamn satisfying and it is worth playing this game just to reach that ending. I don't get close to crying over games very often, but this game got me closer than any other game in recent memory and I mean, Jesus man, it's just so... it's so happy. So I think I've covered what I wanted to talk about, I mean, is there anything I really missed? Oh yeah, listen to this goddamn soundtrack, oh my god! Literally years after this game came out, and these tracks are still being used all over the internet, and for good goddamn reason. Tons of tracks are repurposed into variations of other themes, which sometimes feels like filler in a soundtrack, but nothing feels like Life Light in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Listen, I understand, this is a very good song, and that vocal cover still makes me squeal, but Jesus fucking Christ, I have never wanted so badly to hear that Brawl theme song on the main menu of a Smash game in my entire life. When you hear the same goddamn melody every time you enter a menu, go into the overworld, linger on the result screen of a spirit battle, believe it or not, I would love to hear just about anything else because holy fuck. <laughs> yeah, remember when this video was about Undertale? Yeah, me too. All of these songs are amazing. I cannot think of a single track I dislike, and I mean that 100% sincerely. Every tune fits in super well and builds atmosphere incredibly well. I've never gotten such a vivid picture of environments in a game by listening to just the music alone, but this game is as clear as crystal. Even the main battle theme, the song you hear over and over again, is still catchy to me. Many other encounter themes and other RPGs are well composed, sure, but eventually I get tired of hearing Like yeah, we, we hear it every three seconds, like stop, please. All the music does in this game is just elevates just about every moment in the game, and when the game gives you moments where it's silent, you feel the tension building, and it's incredible how a game this simple managed to be this game changing. Let's be honest with ourselves, this game is no visual masterpiece, I mean we've all seen 8-bit indie games, the 8-bit music, all of it, and we're not really breaking any new ground here, but the attention to detail is what drives even one of the game's biggest shortcomings into a positive. To start small, characters use different fonts for one another. The writing, like I said before, is incredibly rich and gives every NPC attributes that make them all memorable. The attention to detail really shines in the gameplay, however. The number of unique endings specific to each of the main characters is honestly incredible. The contextual way you interact with the various enemies is crazy specific and sometimes humorous even. The list isn't very long, but the amount these attributes and touches really assist in making the game what it is, let's just say it helps it a lot. And the game loves to make you feel a lot of different things. The anger, fear, frustration, injustice, and dissatisfaction I felt after completing my neutral playthrough was enough to drive me to complete the other two routes, and Pacifist nearly made me cry. Dear God. And Genocide also made me almost cry for, you know, different reasons. And Genocide is bar none the most difficult path. Why? This motherfucker. <laughs> That's why. My god, is this a difficult boss, but even at its most frustrating moments, I cannot help but get invigorated with energy while listening to this song. So I mean, what the hell else is there to say? You all know what, what Undertale is at this point, and if not, I mean, you know of it. And I mean, this game's been done to death over the past couple years, and I'm not really helping matters myself. But if you haven't gone and played this game yet, do it! Why are you even watching this video right now? Go buy it right now, you f***ing idiot! You have no excuse anymore! Thank you for watching my very sophisticated and elaborate overview on Undertale. I'm a very responsible adult online, and with that, here's me acting like an idiot featuring music.
Now I know what Sans meant when he said I should be burning in hell.